Okay, so I've got a word for you that's going to step on your toes, but I think it's believe, I believe that it's timely and I think that it's good and I think it'll release you from some bondage. Would you like it? Okay, I'll give it to you then. Um, I'm going to pray first because here's something that can happen. Um, How many of you know who Dave Roberson is? Yeah, you guys definitely know who Dave Roberson is. Um, Dave Roberson's a tremendous father of of the faith. He's, uh, He's out of Tulsa. He wrote a book called The Walk of Spirit, The Walk of Power. Tremendous book. And everywhere that it exists, it exists for free. You can literally jump online, order a copy of it at no cost. They'll send it to you or you can download the entire PDF. Tremendous book. He, in that book, he has this account of, of um, a vision that he had from the Lord of what the demonic realm actually does in churches. So it's really strange because what we think the demonic realm is responsible for, often it is not responsible for. That is just the result of the church's distraction. Okay? So Dave Roberson had this vision. There was this, uh, he said it looked like a Tibetan monk came in and stood in the back of, of the church, and then it had all of these little minions, and it started going throughout the aisles, and it would take seats next to people. And what you think a demon would do to be like, you know what, you should probably kill somebody. You should probably shoot up again, right? And, and speak these things into your, into your spirit that would make you violent or greedy. But that's not what this thing did. You know what it did? It spoke to people and said, do you feel anything? I don't, I don't feel anything. Is the Holy Spirit even here? Did you leave the washer on? Your mortgage is due next week. Do you, even have, do you even have the finances for that? And then what happens is the word of the Lord is literally delivered by an anointed vessel to transform you into the image of God. You're sitting here for 45 minutes and you completely missed it. Right? Not because you were being tempted to use heroin, but because you were being distracted to not receive the word. Just that simple, Right? So I, f- I feel that. I've felt that. And I believe that what I'm going to bring you today is going to be super simple. And it's just one of those things. I had a really deep word that, man, you would have loved, but you have to wait. Um, because the Lord gave me a word for today. And I believe that it's going to bear fruit 100-fold. And I believe that it's extremely important that we tune in. Don't think it's for our neighbor. We're not thinking about what we left in the dryer that's what's, what's souring. Oh, boy, do I get in trouble for that a lot. (laughs) Yeah, you ever put a load in the washer, try to be a good husband, then you turn into a bad husband the next day because it didn't make it to the dryer? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So don't think about that right now either. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this moment. Anything that is trying to distract us from your word, I curse it and send it out in Jesus' name. Father, I ask that you give us clear communication that you open our spirits to receive that this word bear 100 fruit our 100 fold fruit in our lives and that you show us that not only would it bear fruit for us personally but if we lay hold of this word today there will be no empty seats in any churches in Tuscarawas County Father we ask these things in Jesus name and everybody said Amen, Amen. All right turn to the book of John chapter 12 verse 24 All right. Also, I wanted to take a moment real quick. Miss Heidi Thaxton, would you stand just for a moment? Okay. So that is Miss Heidi Thaxton. She is the one that Olivia was referring to when she said she's taking cash for these shirts. But I, I also wanted to allow, uh, I just give credit where credit's due. Um, she works for a printing company, right? Is that what they are? And she kind of birthed this uh, fundraising idea. And we wanted to first let everybody know who she is. She's very quiet in her endeavors, and she rarely gets recognized. And two, we wanted to make sure that you knew who to give money to if you want one of these t-shirts. So, Miss Heidi, would you please raise your hand in the air? Hi, Heidi. Thank you. All right, where did I tell you to go? Good job. John 12. um, What? It was 24, but let's start at 20. Verse 20, the title of this message is The Deception of Selfishness. 
And before we get to this part, I'm going to give you a little bit of a foundation. I want you to be able to make sense of the things that you're encountering in your lives, okay? So oftentimes, we've said this before, that the church always confuses the means with the end. Okay? And one of the things that we don't quite get is that when something opposes you, that's not the end. That's the means. Okay? If something is literally opposing your destiny, it is going to try to do something to derail you. And its attempt 100% of the time, hear this well, because the, the devil, I want to say this like concisely, the devil doesn't work in the overt. The devil works in the subtleties. Have you ever heard the devil's in the details? Yes, okay? So oftentimes what you're mistaking for demonic attack is actually just the result of the demonic attack and not the demonic attack itself. Usually what you think is the demonic attack is just your response to the demonic attack because it turns you into not a very nice person, right? Okay, so everything that comes against you has one, one, one intention. It's to make you selfish. Okay? Why do you think you wake up with a headache? To make you selfish. Okay? And I'm using the word selfish intentionally. It sounds way more negative than it is. But anything that can turn you inward steals your fruit. Okay? If you wake up depressed, why do you think that happens? So you're useless to everyone else. Right? If you wake up with anxiety, you can't even leave your house, right? These things happen, so you become useless to everyone else. The Bible says that by this my Father is glorified that you, say me, that you would bear much fruit. So God's intention is not to do something outside of you, it's to use you to do something. So if you can consistently be swayed to turn inward, then you turning inward actually steals your destiny. And it will be in the details. <clears throat> if you get ill, understand that the intention of putting that illness on your body is simply to make you forget that everybody else needs you. Does make sense? If you're having marital troubles, it's simply to make you forget that everyone else needs you. If you're having health issues, Simply to make you forget that everyone else needs you. Am I walking down the right path here? You okay? Sometimes the easiest thing to get out of something demonic is to recognize it. Like, shoot, it's him the whole time, right? You, you, the, because it's subtle, because it's in the details, we often don't accredit him for the things that he's trying to do. And if what he's trying to do is simply make you selfish, he'll steal your destiny. Selfishness yields loneliness. Loneliness yields victimhood. Victimhoods don't do anything for anybody but themselves. Right? Okay, John 12, 20. It says, now there came, excuse me, now there were certain Greeks among them who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was at Bethsaida of Galilee, and said, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Okay? He explains it in the next line. Have no fear. He's not talking about farming. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Okay, so these are some foundational Jesus teachings, right? Almost the, the, the first message that you hear when you're converted is that if you want to save your life, you have to lose it. Right? But what we don't understand always is that we're trading our pebbles in for diamonds. It's not actually a life of sacrifice. It's an upgrade. But what he gets us to realize is how many of you ever experienced loneliness? Have you ever considered that your loneliness might actually be a result of selfishness? <coughs> selfishness sounds cruel, but how about this? Self-preservation. 
okay? You won't be in a, in a deep covenant relationship with someone. Why? I don't want to get hurt. They take all my time. They always need something. Whatever, right? So you have this offshoot of loneliness, and the Bible says that unless you forget about you, you'll remain alone. That the byproduct of selfishness is loneliness. Here's the strange thing. The opposite of loneliness is fruitfulness. So once you're no longer self-centered, then you become productive. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and died, it dies, it will be lonely. But if it dies, say if it dies. Do you understand what dying is in the Bible, right? It's not literal. Okay? It is your co-union with Jesus' death that put an end to everything carnal that you ever were. <coughs> right? So if you participate in that... If you allow that to be laid in the grave, then you'll no longer be lonely because your lonely was actually an offshoot of your self-preservation because you can't be in a healthy relationship if you make the relationship about what you get from it. Right? So our days should look like Jesus' days. One of the things my wife likes to, to say in marriage counseling with couples, which we really don't do much, is that you can't fall out of love. Okay? It is impossible to fall out of love by the very nature of love because love is an expression of your identity. It's not a reward for someone's performance. Did you get it? Because it was way better than your response. <laughs> love by its very nature is eternal. You can't fall out of love with someone. You can only fall out of need. If you were in the relationship for the wrong reasons in the first place, then that person stops meeting your needs. They stop meeting your expectations. They stop attaining to your level of performance. And you start to withhold affection from them. It's not love. It's law, and it will sow death into your home, into your relationships, and into your friendships. But here's the, the strange thing, and I, the, the kingdom has to be looked at through, through very scrutinizing eyes. Because, again, the kingdom's not overt, it's a mustard seed. So you wonder why you're lonely in your home. You wonder why you're lonely in your relationships. You wonder why you're lonely at work. Maybe because you're in them for yourself. Right? Shanda and I used to be Actually, I still, I still speak with him occasionally. Friends with a, a world-renowned marriage counselor. And he was of the opinion. I, I'm not talking about marriage. I'm just showing you what, what biblical relationships look like. He is of the opinion that you can put any man and any woman in a relationship and teach them to love. And they would have a successful marriage. The one doesn't exist. I'm going to give you some really practical stuff that I wasn't planning on, okay? If a man knows how to be an expression of love, it doesn't matter who the other person in the relationship is, they can love that person. If a woman knows how to be an expression of feminine love, it doesn't matter who the man in the relationship is, they can have a successful relationship, right? If you fall out of love, you are in it for selfish reasons. Okay, does that make sense? One of my dear friends lost his wife tragically early. And um, they, they were like inseparable. They did everything together and he remarried really quick. And, you know, his, his family revolted, his friends were upset and you name it, yada, yada, yada. And personally, I had, I had to reconcile it because I officiated his next wedding. And so I started studying and, and even secular research shows the people in the happiest marriages marry the fastest. After the, after the decease of a spouse. Do you know why? Because they have an expression of themselves that needs a target. Does that make sense? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love keeps no records of wrongs, right? Love in itself has its own essence. And suffering long is its essence. The moment you become self-preserving, you can no longer function in love. So unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it will stay lonely. Do you know, did you notice what happened to the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 when he went to the fields to feed swine? 
Nobody would give him anything. Why would nobody give him anything? Because everybody's living the same life. They're all trying to make it. They're all trying to preserve self. They're all trying to make sure that they have enough for the next day. So they didn't live in what looks like kingdom community where all, th- all people had everything in common and they shared in each other's burdens. They were all trying to make sure that they had enough and that you could have what's left over of your time, of your treasures, of your resources, whatever it might be. And that is not how heaven comes to earth. The reason I'm preaching this message is because my wife said two things this week. She said the church has lost its joy, okay? And I promise you, you cannot have joy if you're selfish. You will always be looking at someone to appease your selfish need, and they will never, ever meet your expectations. Yep, and you'll be the one that's always mad about it, right? So forget about you. If you want to have peace, get over yourself. Quickest way to do it. Second thing she said, was my wife and I were sitting in our living room, and uh, <laughs> sometimes I get, I don't even know, you'd be able to present this better than I would. My wife's a licensed counselor, and she's working towards her doctor, doctorate in temperament therapy. And one of the things that I have to overcome as a human being is, is protecting my energy reserves. Like, I don't, what am I called, phlegmatic? Yeah. I'm phlegmatic, phlegmatic, okay? So that means I'm kind of even keel, not big highs, not low lows, but one of the things that I do is I'm, I'm very particular over what I expend energy on. And she looked at me and she's like, <laughs> she's like, what if Jesus treated you with his energy like you treat everyone else with yours? It's like, shut Uh. (laughs) okay so i'm preaching to myself understand this okay but what if i was like jesus i need you and i'm like it's my day off right jesus's life i'm not saying that you shouldn't take time to value with your family i'm not saying that you shouldn't Uh, like anoint or separate time for specific purposes, that's totally fine. But don't be selfish, right? Selfishness and stewardship are completely different. But it's a fine line. So in order for the church to get their joy back, you'll never be happy as long as you're trying to defend yourself against everyone. We always use the example of the four-way stop. Like what happens when you get there at the same time and you're like, go ahead, and he waves and goes by. You're like, good day. No, not whenever you get there and the guy just bolts through and you're like, come on! Same thing happened in both instances, but one time you gave, the other time it was taken. The difference is you, not them. (coughs) Right? You want joy? Get over yourself. That's where we're at. There's a world full of people that think death is their savior, and you have life and life abundant to give them. If you don't see that the attacks against your life in peace are to the end that you would just turn inward and forget about them, then you will forever, listen, be stuck in this same cycle where you say, well, when my house is paid off, I'll commit. When my kids are raised, I'll commit. When I'm healthier, I'll commit. When I'm younger, when I'm older, when I'm this, you'll you'll always have a reason to turn inward and take care of what's in front of you. And then before you know it, you'll have no fruit to bear. Right? Go to Matthew chapter 9. You guys know what that is, don't you? Adam's Family. Did anyone see the Adam's Family cartoon that came out within the last couple of years? I was offended by that. (laughs) Gomez Adams was like a gentleman, right? A romantic. And they made him a little short, pudgy guy with a funny voice in the cartoon. Morticia still gets to be, like, tall and hourglassy, but no, I don't get it. The actor that played Gomez, 
What was, I don't remember his name. He's phenomenal. Good stuff. Okay, where did I tell you to turn? Matthew chapter 9. Are you there? Good for you. I'm not. Okay. We've got two passages of scripture that we're going to read. Um, the thing that Jesus wrapped up with in the last passage, he said that if you want to find your life, you have to lose it. If you want to follow him, you have to act like him. And what he did was considered himself of no reputation and became a servant to all, right? So that is Christ-likeness. That is the demonstration of heaven on earth. But what we get to do now, because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were diligent in recording their activity with Jesus, is we actually get to see what Jesus' life looked like day to day. And some of the times, the liberties that we would take for ourselves are not the liberties that Jesus would take for himself. And it's hard to reconcile because we're just humans... We are the manifestation of God on earth. So if Jesus lived as a manifest son on earth, then you and I should look at his example as something that he's attained for us already, not something just to measure up to. But realizing that if there's a difference between the sacrifice that he's willing to make for people and the sacrifice that we're willing to make for people, then it has to, there has to be a, a justification for that chasm. And we have to close it, right? Okay, Matthew chapter 9. Verse 1, it says, he got in the boat, he crossed over, he came to his own city. Where's, where's Jesus going? Home. Everybody say home. Okay? Jesus is coming back to his own city after a missions trip. He's getting here to kick his feet up. He's going to relax. He's going to get some R&R. &R, and I'm going to read you what Jesus' day looked like. During his homecoming. Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic. Son of a gun. Boy, just steps off the boat. And there's a girl that can't walk. <clears throat> Lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the par paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And at once, some of the scribes within themselves said, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing those thoughts, says, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Do you ever stop to think that maybe Jesus had more value for what he carried than what he needed? Jesus had more value for what he carried for others than what he needed for himself. Comes home, ends a missions trip, and they bring him a paralytic. First thing he does is heals a paralytic. Now, good for Jesus. Let's give him an applause. He took time off. Or excuse me, he looked time on his day off to take care of this young lady. Go down to verse 18. While he spoke these things, okay, so let me set this up. Jesus ex is explaining why he's allowed to forgive sins and heal people to the Pharisees. That's what I didn't read. We've, we've taught on that a bunch of times. Then, while he was speaking these things, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly, oh, shoot. <laughs> okay, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I also don't want you to get lost, okay? Jesus is there with the paralytic. He heals the paralytic. Now he's trying to defend himself to some religious people. Good day, right? Sounds really familiar. And then after he gets done explaining himself to the religious people, somebody says, hey, my daughter's, listen, dead. Did you ever stop for a moment? How many of you are leaders of people in this church? How many of you have an active ministry? You don't have to have a title, but you're somebody that people depend on, right? And it hurts to bear their pain all the time. You hear bad news, you hear of divorces, you hear of marital troubles, you officiate funerals. Sometimes you have to go from a child's funeral to somebody's wedding and not let them know that you're dying inside. Jesus is literally doing this. He's walking it out for you in one day. <coughs> While he's on his way with grieving parents who lost their daughter, the woman with the issue of blood comes and steals a healing from him. Get it? You see this guy? 
This is our brother. This is the one that we're made in the image of. This is the one that doesn't take time for himself because he places too much value in what he carries. At some point, you have to be responsible and see that you're the solution to the world's problems. You won't be happy till you give it all up. You're made in his image. What makes him happy makes you happy. Jesus arose followed, and followed him, and so did his disciples. Now, how many of you have spent time around a grieving parent? It's awful. It, it's exhausting. My, my best friends lost their child. And Shanda and I had a, uh, a prayer meeting two days after they lost their child at one of our leaders' homes. And when we walked into the prayer meeting, they said, what happened to you guys? You look like you've been in a fight. We spent two days around grieving parents. It was painful. It hurt. Jesus is literally walking with grieving parents, and there's a woman that literally grabs his garment, okay? She didn't ask for an appointment. Listen, she, she didn't ask permission. She just took what he was carrying. And Jesus didn't turn around and say, how could you? I'm with grieving parents, you insolent. He said, wow, who touched me? His disciples said, Jesus, we've got grieving parents with us. People are thronging against you. And he says, no, no, no. Somebody touched me and I felt virtue go out from me. Somebody approached me on, on right conditions. They approached me knowing that I have something that I carry that they need. And then he looks at her and says, daughter, your faith has made you well. <clears throat> he wasn't mad at the paralytic. He wasn't mad at the, the grieving parents. He wasn't mad at the woman who interrupted the meeting with the grieving parents to get her, meet, her needs met. You understand what I'm saying? This boy's built different. He lives different. Verse 23, when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room, the girl's not dead, she's just sleeping. And they ridiculed him, but the crowd was outside. He went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of this went out into all the land. Now, you have to see all aspects of this. Jesus heals a dead girl in the midst of a bunch of haters and naysayers. How many of you ever let a Facebook attack get you down for about 36 hours? Yep, how could my friend say that? How could my friend leave me over my beliefs? Why don't they believe in me? I'm, I'm just trying to do good things. Listen, Jesus could have stopped right there and said, guys, I just healed a paralytic. I've been hanging with, with grieving parents. A woman came and stole something from me. Now I'm here to help your daughter, and you're literally ridiculing me. You, I don't deserve this. See what I'm building up to? This is a big deal, man. He said to them, make room, the girl's not dead, she's just sleeping, and they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report went out into all the land. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. Nearly comical. Back up, where's Jesus trying to go? Home. The boy's trying to go home. Okay, it's his day off. He just finished a missions trip. And this is the life that he lives. Two blind men followed him and cried out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And he had, excuse me, and he had come into the house. The blind men came to him, and Jesus said, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one sees this. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him to all of that country. As they went out, Behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon-possessed. You didn't think this could get any worse. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, 
And the multitude marveled, saying, It was never seen like this before in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the ruler of demons. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You see that? Jesus tried to take a day off, and he said, No, what? This ain't for me. He got done with meeting everyone's needs, and then he planned his own itineraries. Like, we are not day off kind of people. Right? People have needs. People have, have things that I am the solution for. And if I value what I carry more than what I need, then I will live a life that pours out rather than one that is a constant vacuum. Unless one falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. You will not have any sincere relationships. No marriages, no relationships with your children, no relationship with your parents, no relationship with your friends. If you're constantly expecting them to live up your, for your expectations, and that's why you're there. Right? Jesus demanded nothing from these people. He never shamed them. He tried to go home, and he got sidetracked. sidetracked. <clears throat> now, that's what a day in the life of Jesus looks like. Now, go to Matthew. No, no, no. I'm probably wrong. Hold up. Yeah, go to Matthew 14. Start in verse 1. So you guys know who John the Baptist is, right? Okay, I want to show you what selfishness does to you. John the Baptist was the first character that we see in John chapter 1. He's literally making straight the way of the Lord. He's baptizing people in the Jordan River. He's telling everybody about Jesus. He has the most fruitful ministry that the, that, that transitional period had ever seen. And he was such a humble man that when Jesus showed up on the scene, he said, I must decrease, he must increase. All of my disciples, go follow that guy. And he stepped out of ministry. He was Jesus' champion. He wasn't just his champion, he was also his cousin. They were only six months apart in age. And then John the Baptist gets captured by King Herod. And he is so upset that he is in jail, listen, that he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, so will you do me a favor, go ask that Jesus guy if he's really the Messiah for waiting on somebody else. You see what happened? I don't want you to see what, see what happened theologically. He went from fruitful ministry to selfish ambition and he turned into a doubter. Right? The guy that he championed, the guy that he celebrated, the guy that he made straight the ways of the Lord for, he started doubting when something bad happened to him. Because when something bad happens to you, it's to turn you inward. That was so quiet. You get what I'm saying? Okay, so he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, ask that punk if he's the real deal. <laughs> then Herod's wife's birthday comes around. Do you know what Herod's wife wants? John's head on a platter. What kind of sick, twisted woman in that? But... Just like every husband, he gave it to her. The disciples carried John the Baptist's body out. They buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. Okay? Jesus' cousin, Jesus' ministry partner, literally the first relationship that Jesus ever had. Do you know when Mary... Saw Elizabeth, John the Baptist leaped in Elizabeth's womb because she met, he met Jesus in utero. The first connection that Jesus ever made as a human being in utero. There's John the Baptist. Now the disciples just carry the, the body of his cousin out, bury it, and they come deliver the news to Jesus. And that's where we're going to pick up. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. 
It says, when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. Isn't that what you'd do? Is that what you'd do? I need some alone time. I need to process. I need to think. I need to lick my wounds. Next line. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And he was ticked because they didn't respect his privacy. And he was moved with compassion for them. Come on, man. That's my Jesus. Perhaps the most painful thing that he's experienced next to his own demise is the death of his forerunner and cousin. He tries to get away to a deserted place by himself and the multitudes follow him and he turns around. He doesn't look at them with disgust. He doesn't look at them with contempt. He looks at them with compassion and heals all their sickness. When it was evening, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. Everybody has that person in your life that tries to protect you, right? Tries to protect your time, tries to protect your your, your feelings, tries to make sure that you're well rested, and then Jesus said, They don't need to go away. Come on. That's the life I want to live. They don't need to go away. I'm so secure in what I get from the Father that I can meet the needs of everyone around me. I don't need a moon-licking time. I don't need to to protect my energy. I can give and give and give and give. (coughs) There's a strange thing that, that happens to you when you decide to get over yourself as you finally find happiness. When Shanda and I were with our our friends who lost their child, we were with them for 72 hours straight. How many of you have ever, like, you guys know what it's like, right? You have jobs, you have schedules, you have kids, you have baseball games, but then something traumatic, like just, just terrible happens, and everybody has to cancel everything. Even though you're in the hospital waiting room eating day-old pizza, there's something really strange and peaceful about knowing that all of your attention is being fo- focused on somebody that's going through something. Right? There's a, there's a nostalgia that comes from trauma where you look back on it and you wonder why you felt so much peace. Because the depth of the trauma finally got you to get over yourself enough to enjoy what selflessness looks like. You know what I'm talking about, right? Are we all right? Okay. Okay. This is the life that I want to live. This is the life that I believe transforms culture. Right? There's lonely people out there all over, and they've been taught. Listen, the best uh, personal leadership and life coaches in the world are teaching them to put yourself first. Right? Don't let somebody schedule you. You schedule other people. Somebody has to be the most important. Jesus literally was equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Okay? Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that did not count it robbery to be called equal with God, step one, but made himself of no reputation. Okay? He didn't use his title. He didn't use his standing. He didn't use his heavenly nature to get what he thought he deserved. He used it to pour out to meet the needs of other people. That's authentic Christ-likeness. You believe it? Okay. I believe that whatever you're facing right now is a scheme, okay? I want you to understand something about schemes and snares. The only way to get out of a snare is to stop pulling. You don't get it, do you? Just keep paying attention to this snare, right? Snares take zero effort to get into, right? They're just buried under some leaves. You catch it on your foot. If you see it on your foot, you can be like, ooh, step out and step over. 
But once you realize you're in a snare, you just keep paying attention to it. And you walk and you keep pulling. And guess what happens as you pull? A stupid snare, right? You're just paying attention to the snare, trying to run and run and run. And guess what? The snare never goes away. Forget about the snare. Right? Forget about the headache. Forget about the anxiety. Forget about the depression. Forget about the marital issues. Forget about all of the things that are keeping you distracted from living a life laid down. Forget about all of the things that are coming to knock on your door simply for the purpose of making you fruitless so you become selfish. Right? You can do something. Paul wrote the most extravagant gospel letters that he ever penned when he was in jail. Right? John the Baptist is in jail. What's he do? He starts spitting venom at Jesus. Paul's in jail. He starts writing the most life-giving letters that he's got. He can't go to their city. Right? He can't travel on a missions trip. But what he does have is Roman rights to send mail. So he's going to use what, he, what he's got in the time that he has to give life to others. John the Revelator was sent by himself to the island of Patmos. He had all right and reason to complain. Boy, just got out of a pot of boiling oil. And instead of complaining, he was in church on the Lord's Day. And he wrote the most spectacular revelatory letter that is penned in the entire New Testament. Right? You will find peace. You will find fruitfulness when you get over yourself. Would you stand with me? <clears throat> How many of you are facing something that, uh, that this message highlighted as the thing that's trying to steal your fruitfulness? Oh. Once you see it, you're like, you son of a gun, right? <laughs> weeks, still weeks, sometimes days, sometimes years. This whole time, God redeems time. Okay. So I'm saying prophetically that all of the fruit that you missed out on bearing is going to come in multitudes starting now on. Yeah, yep, you missed nothing. No purpose of God can be thwarted. And your commitment to step into what he's called you to right now and step out of the distractions is what's going to pave the way to 100-fold fruit. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you so much for this word. I ask that you do... Um, what you promised to do, Father, and give us the ability to understand this word, to stand under it and be governed by it. Father, there is a deception in selfishness. And Father, we ask that, uh, that we're able to accept and express the culture of heaven when it comes to being poured out like a drink offering, like Paul said he was. So Father, I'm asking that things drastically change. Give us peace and the willingness to spend and be spent. For the people around us, for the people we love, and for the people that don't love us.